Welcome back everyone. Today is for the bridge engineers or prospective bridge engineers. We're talking about influence lines. So let's start this off assuming we have a three span bridge, 30 feet per span. And let's say I'm interested in my moment and shear demands right at the middle here. So let's call that moment at G and shear at G at point G. And intuitively, I know that's gonna be an important point mid span of my center span. I know I'm gonna have fairly large moments there. So I'm interested in what are the demands. However, I don't necessarily know the load. And if we're doing bridge design, we know the load is in fact going to move. So let's say, for example, that my load is positioned at some location here, and let's call that location X. Let's say it's one car, and it's driving across my bridge in this direction. So at some point, as that car is driving across the bridge, I'm going to have the maximum possible shear and the maximum possible moment at my location of interest. So where is that? To answer that question, let's look at an influence line. So let's back up and let's say that X, my distance here is just five feet. So my load is back here and I can do statics. I can find my reaction forces at A, C, D, and F. And then I can consequently find my shear and moment at location G. And for that point, the X axis in both of these diagrams is going to be the position of my load. And the Y axis is either going to be my shear at location G or my moment at location G. So if my load is positioned at five feet, for example, well, we can find a shear, we can also find a moment. Then we move our load. We'll move our load now to say, for example, 10 feet and I can get another shear and I can get another moment. And then we'll once again move the load. Let's say it's at 11 feet, so it's directly above this hinge. I'll get another shear and another moment. And I can proceed down the structure in this way, solving a lot of structural analysis problems as this load moves across. So we'll get a lot of dots. If I connect those dots, we'll find that the diagram looks something like this for shear. And it will look like this for my moment. Now, these two diagrams, they look sort of like shear and moment diagrams, but they are not the same thing. These are actually known as influence lines. So an influence line describes a specific action. So that can be a reaction force. It can be a shear force in terms of the beam or an internal moment at some specific location for a moving unit load at position X. So when we say unit load, we just mean it has a quantity one with whatever unit we want to attach to that. So that can be a pound. It can be a kip. It can be a car. Now these are markedly different from shear and moment diagrams. So if, for example, this diagram on the left is a moment diagram, this tells me for a given load case, the X is going to represent the position where I'm calculating my moment. So again, we have a given load and I'm looking at my moment across the length of my structure. Now for an influence line, We'll label this at, as a moment at a specific location, for example, location B here. So again, this is a specific point or a specific moment that I'm looking at. And now my X axis represents the position of the load. So my load is moving across the structure and that load could have a unit of whatever I want and a magnitude of one. To calculate an influence line, we actually have a few different methods. So the first method that we illustrated at the beginning of this video was just the naive approach. So it was just to march a load across the structure and do a lot of different structural analyses, finding my moment and my shear at a specific location, and then plotting it on a line. That is extremely tedious. And so we're going to show one different method here, still using statics. And in a follow-up video, we'll have a second method, which is a geometric method, and it's something called the Mueller-Breslau principle. So keep your eyes out for that one. For right now, let's focus on using statics to find an influence line. So let's return to our original structure and we'll put a load on it. And I'll just call this a unit load of one. I'll leave the units off because that could be anything we want. So we have a load of one and it's moving across the structure where its current position is X. Now we'll notice that this load can be in three different regions on my structure. So it can be from region A to B or from region B to E or from E to F. And how I've broken this up is the typical division that we'll do when we're trying to find reaction forces. I'll take 
slices at, in this case, my hinges or any other release, and we can use that to solve the reaction forces. We do this because we get three different cases for equilibrium. So case one is if the load is in section AB, so that's from zero to 15 feet. Or I could say that the load is between B and E, so that's from 15 to 75 feet. Or finally, the load could be from section E to F, so that's from 75 to 90 feet. And let's draw the dimensions for the position of that load. Um, in case one, that load is positioned at X away from point A. In case two, this distance from point B is X minus 15, because X would be normally measured from point A, and I'm subtracting off the 15 foot distance that I got to point B. Lastly, if we find the position of the load in EF for case three, this is going to be X minus 75. So now I can find the reaction forces for each of these cases, and it will look different for each case, just because that load is moving into different free body diagrams for my structure. So we'll start with case A. If we do a sum of moments about point A, we'll find that there's a shear here at B and it's equal to X over 15. And we can also solve using sum of forces in the Y direction that this is one minus X over 15. We know that the shear on the other side of this hinge is going to be equal and opposite, so that's X over 15. And then I can use sum of moments and sum of forces to find my reactions at C and D. However, there's still one more force here at E that I don't know. So if we look at equilibrium first of EF, we'll find that in fact, the shear here is zero and the reaction force is also zero. So that's pretty simple. So therefore we also have zero on the other end of the hinge and we can solve for the reaction at C, which is X over 10 and the reaction at D, which is negative X over 30. So the negative sign indicates that I've drawn this arrow in the wrong direction. Moving on to case two, we'll see that both A, B, and E, F, they have no external load. And if I take, for example, some moments about A, I'll find that this shear is zero. So therefore this reaction has to be zero. And the same thing happens from E to F. So all those are zero, we'll fill in the zeros. And now all we need to do is statics to find our reactions here at C and D. So a sum of moments around C will tell me my reaction here is X over 30 minus one. And then sum of forces in the Y direction tells me this is two minus X over 30. Finally, going to the last case, as we've seen before, these two are going to be zero. And I'll solve for my reaction at F first by taking a sum of moments around E. And we'll find that reaction is X over 15 minus five and the resulting shear at location E is going to be six minus X over 15. And that's going to be applied equal and opposite on the other side of E. We found this shear at B was zero, and therefore I can solve for my reaction forces at C and D. So at C, this will be X over 30 minus three. And at D, this is nine minus X over 10. So now that I've gotten all my reaction forces, let's start looking at the shear and moment at point G, because that was ultimately what I was interested in. To do that, we're going to have to take an additional slice now at mid span right here. So again, this is my point G, and I'm taking another slice there. And now I have four free body diagrams that describes the statics for this beam. So let's place our load again on the structure depending on which free body diagram we are in. Now in all of these cases, I'm interested in my shear and moment here at point G. So here's my shear at G and here's my moment at G. And of course they have to be equal and opposite. And I'll write that on all free body diagrams. So now let's go through and solve each case. So if I'm looking at case one, if I wanna solve for VG and MG, so my shear and moment at G, I really only need to look at this free body diagram right here. And that will tell me everything I need to know. And in fact, I already know my shear here at B, we saw that that was X over 15 acting down and my reaction force was X over 10 acting up. And those were taken from case one to begin with because case one was when my load was located be between zero and 15. So given that we know that this is X over 15 down, this is X over 10 up, we can therefore solve for the shear at location G and it is equal to X over 30 acting 
down on this side and up on the opposite side, so that is a positive shear. And we can also find the moment by taking a sum of moments, and we'll see that this is negative x over 2. Next, we'll move to the second case, and the second case has to get divided up into two subcases, case 2a and case 2b, where the load is going to be either from b to g here or from g to e here. Now, in both cases, we saw that the reaction forces were identical because we saw that the reaction forces, if we go back to that diagram, are going to be equal to 2 minus x over 30 or x over 30 minus 1, regardless of whether the load is on this half over here or on the other half. So to solve for my shear and moment, again, I just need to pick one free body diagram in either case. For case 2a, I'm going to pick this diagram on the right just because it has easier statics. It doesn't have a downward load of 1. And in this case, I have a force here in E. It's equal to 0. And then I have a reaction force here at D, which is equal to x over 30 minus 1. So therefore, I can solve for my shear. Sum of forces in the y direction just tells me this is 1 minus x over 30. And my moment in this case is going to be x over 2 minus 15. Moving on to case 2b, I'm going to return to my first free body diagram here, again, just because the statics are easier. So we saw the shear at b was equal to 0, and my reaction force at c was 2 minus x over 30. So therefore, my shear at this location, vg, is also 2 minus x over 30, just doing a sum of forces in the y direction. And a sum of moments will tell me that my moment at that location g is equal to 30 minus x over 2. Now, finally, I get to move to case 3. My reaction forces will therefore be for the case where x is between 75 and 90. So in this case, I'm going to once again consider the free body diagram for b, c. The shear is 0, of course, over there. And... My reaction force is x over 30 minus 3. So therefore, the shear at point G is equal to x over 30 minus 3, just from the sum of forces. And my moment at G, taking a sum of moments, is x over 2 minus 45. So therefore, I've solved for all of my shear at point G as that load moves across. And I've also solved for my moments at point G as that load is moving across the structure. So let's plot this, and the resulting plot will be an influence line. So here I've summarized the results from my statics for the four cases, case 1, 2a, 2b, and 3, where I have my shear and my moment as it varies along the structure. So I'm going to divide my structure up into... The different regions where it goes from 15, 45, 75 here, all the way to 90. And similarly for the moment, 15, 45 was mid-span, 75, and then 90 at the end. And I'm also, just to help me remember, I'm going to put little red dots here wherever I had one of the supports. And that will help me visualize my structure as I'm going across. Those supports were every 30 feet. So if I plot my four shear equations, we'll see that all four shear equations are a line and it looks something like this. So we have a positive slope to begin and this value right here is 0.5. And then we have a negative slope from 15 to 45. This value is going to be negative 0.5. And then if I evaluate it from 45 to 75, this suddenly jumps up to 0.5 right here. And again, I have a negative slope that ends at a negative 0.5. Finally, I have a positive slope that brings me back to zero. Now, if I look at the moment equations, it starts as a negative slope, and this goes to negative 7.5 if I'm evaluating, in this case, negative x over 2. That's negative 15 divided by 2. Then I have a positive slope, and it ends at 7.5. I have a negative slope. It's once again at negative 7.5, and then a positive slope taking me back to zero. Now, the influence lines tell me what is my shear or my moment at location G for a unit load? And a unit load always has a magnitude of 1. So therefore, if I have a unit load of 1 and it's positioned here at 15, then my shear 
at g, which is at 45, is equal to 0 0.5, and my moment is equal to negative 7.5. Or if my load moves to just past 45 feet. So we'll say that's 45.0001 feet. And it's a load of magnitude 1. Then my shear at position G is positive 0.5 again. And my moment is now a positive 7.5. So I can use these influence lines to find out what are the maximum possible shear and moment in my structure as this load is moving across. Now if I have some other load quantity, I just need to scale up my influence line. So let's say, for example, my load P as it's moving across is 20 kips. Now, in this case, if my load is positioned at 15 feet here, my shear at G is going to be that 20 kips multiplied by 0.5. And so that is a shear of 10 kips at location G. Similarly, my moment at G for the load located at the same spot is 20 kips and it's going to be multiplied by 7.5. The units seem a little bit weird here, but the units for a moment influence line are the same as the units for your x axis. And in this case, it's feet. So we'll put feet here. So therefore it's 20 kips times 7.5 feet, which is 150 kip feet. And that wraps up this introduction to influence lines. I'll follow this up with a video on the Mueller-Breslau principle, which allows us to calculate the influence lines using geometry rather than statics. So as always, I hope you learned something. Please subscribe and I will see you next time.